there is not a specific timeline, but 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 we are acting. We are acting uh, expeditiously. Canada's transport minister commenting on the ban imposed by the U.S. and U.K. on certain electronics on flights from parts of the Middle East and Africa. The United States prohibiting devices larger than a cell phone on U.S. bound flights from 10 airports in eight majority Muslim countries. The ban requires that those devices be carried in the cargo hold. The order affecting more than 50 flights a day. Terrorism analyst Paul Cruikshank telling CNN that the ban indicates a lack of faith on the part of officials as far as security at the affected airports. It's clear uh, that with these new restrictions, uh, the United States um, is, is essentially saying that they do not have full confidence uh, in these airports uh, in these various countries. While there's no specific plot, the ban, according to a U.S. official, was in part prompted by intelligence collected in recent weeks, indicating that al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula was perfecting techniques for concealing explosives inside batteries and battery compartments. In the United Kingdom, the ban affects flights from six countries, including Tunisia and Lebanon, those two not part of the U.S. ban. The fact the United Kingdom appears to be considering similar restrictions uh, indicates um, that um, there is intelligence out there which is creating concern. I'm Reed Binion reporting. Through his propaganda arm, North Korea's combative young dictator ramps up his threats against America. With martial music and a breathless female narrator, a new video from Kim Jong-un's regime shows a fictional image of a U.S. aircraft carrier getting blown up. The narrator calls the carrier pathetic and says it would die with a dagger in its neck. The narrator calls the plane a moth that would, quote, fall by getting hit by a rain of fire. We're looking at a situation where the Korean Peninsula's tensions have significantly elevated. This kind of imagery coming out of Pyongyang is clearly meant to stoke that fire, to really try and intimidate the Americans to say, you know, we're not, we, the North Koreans, aren't intimidated and we are prepared to hurt you. The narrator refers to joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises now being conducted. She calls America a warmonger. Kim's regime views those drills as rehearsals for an invasion of North Korea. The video also comes just after Secretary of State Rex Tillerson visited the region and said the Trump administration would consider a preemptive military strike on North Korea if the threat from Kim is elevated. With all of the discussion about how the U.S. is focused on dealing with North Korea, preparing sanctions, potentially other moves, I think what Kim Jong-un is doing is he's not testing, he's signaling. He might be doing this in preparation of some kind of pushback. The video also comes on the heels of recent missile and rocket engine tests by the North Koreans. U.S. and military intelligence officials are not commenting tonight on this theatrical threat from Kim. In recent months, his regime has released propaganda videos showing North Korean commandos assaulting the South Korean president's official residence, the Blue House. One chilling video depicted a nuclear explosion on the Washington Mall. Analysts say these releases are also meant as a signal to North Korean citizens. This reinforces what the North Korean government wants them to believe, that they have a mighty military and they're ready to take offensive action if necessary to defend the equities of the North Korean people. Caesar, welcome to the program. It's not your name and you are in disguise. How dangerous would it be if people knew who you were? 
After three years, I have wanted to come out on the international media with my voice and with my real face. And I have the evidence and the documents and the pictures that show what the regime crimes are. But until today, I haven't had the chance to come out with my face. Caesar, can you tell me what your job was and why you decided to publicize, to smuggle out these pictures? I used to work inside the military police with a group of other photographers that have different specialties. Our job before the revolution, we took pictures of accidents. If somebody was killed, if there was a suicide, if there was someone who drowned, or if there was a fire. Part of our work in the forensic evidence section is to go and to document these accidents and to work with the judges and the detectives from the military police. But after the beginning of the revolution, after 2011, my work changed in a very full, fundamental way. We were no longer taking pictures of accidents or suicides or a drowning. All of our work, for me and for my team, was to take pictures of martyrs of prisoners that were detained in the Assad jails. When did you realize that your job had changed? And were there many, many more bodies that you were photographing on a regular basis than before the revolution? There were small numbers at first, at the beginning of the revolution. We would take in a day 10 to 20 people, sometimes five to 10 bodies that we would get daily. But as the revolution went on, at the beginning of 2012, for example, the number started going up in a very marked way. We started taking photos of 20, then 30, until it came to a point where we were taking like 50 uh, or more bodies every day by 2013, for example. Caesar, we are seeing really horrible pictures. We have them projected on our wall here. These are the pictures that you smuggled out. What were the causes of death that you were recording? Most of the bodies that we were taking photos of were f of people that, by the way, were peaceful people. These are some of the people that just took part of the, revolu of the protests in Damascus and in Dara calling for freedom. There was signs of sometimes them being shot. And you can see many wounds in their heads, in their bodies, in their arms. We began to take photographs of bodies that had all these signs of all types of torture, of starvation for long periods of time, and there would be a, patho a doctor, and there would be a photographer, and there would be people from the security forces with us to go body by body, and we would number them based on the number that they were murdered in, عالی ترین نشان ترکیه از طرف آقای اردوغان به امیر کویت داده شد تا آنچنان که در برنامه پیشین هم اشاره کردیم تاکیدی باشد بر اهمیت روابط میان دو کشور این نشان به گفته آقای اردوغان بابت تلاش امیر کویت در تقویت روابط دو کشور است اما گذشته از این مراسم های مرسوم میان سران کشورها آنچه که باید دستاورد این سفر و این دیدار نامید امضای شش توافق نامه همکاری در زمینه های مختلف میان ترکیه و کویت است ترکیه میل دارد در قالب شورای همکاری خلیج فارس همکاری های گسترده ای با کشورهای عضو این شورا داشته باشد و گسترش روابط با کویت این کشور همیشه بیهاشیه و گاه میانجی در همین راست است 
اما یک سفر دیگر که برای ترکیه دارای اهمیت است و نتایج آن با تحولات منطقه گره خورده سفر مولود چاوش اغلو وزیر خارجه این کشور به امریکاست جایی که وزرای کشورهای عضو ائتلاف ضد داعش دور هم گرد آمدند اهمیت سفر چاوش اغلو به امریکا از دو جهت مهم است نخص ترکیه از امریکا میخواهد تکلیفش را با نیروهای کرد یپگ مشخص کند ترکیه میل ندارد امریکا این متحد دیروز خود را حامی گروهی به نام یپگ ببیند که ترکیه از اساس این گروه را به رسمیت نمی شناسد ترکیه خواسته دیگری هم دارد استرداد فتح الله گلن موضوعی که در دولت اوباما محقق نشد حالا ترکیه امیدش به دولت ترامپ است چاوش اغلو روز گذشته در دیدار با جف سشنر وزیر دادگستری امریکا این خواستش را مطرح کرده خواسته ای که بعید است با شرایطی که ترکیه میل دارد پیش برود اما ترکیه کاردار آلمان در آنکارا را فراخوانده این بار البته از بابت موضوع دیگر و آن همین که سرویس اطلاعاتی آلمان گفته گروه و گلن نقشی در کودتای تابستان گذشته ترکیه نداشته اظهار نظری که ابدا به مذاق مقامات ترکیه خوش نخواهد آمد چرا که از اساس دولت ترکیه کودتا در این کشور را به جماعت گلن گره زده وزارت خارجه ترکیه هم در این رابطه بیانیه صادر کرده و گفته تمامی مکالمات کودتاگران را در شب قبل و بعد از حادثه در اختیار دارد و تعییدی بر نقش این گروه در کودتا است در سوی دیگر همچنان دامنه تنش میان ترکیه و اروپا نسبتا بالاست یا سعی می شود بالا نگاه داشته شود آن هم از این بابت که روز گذشته بکر بزداغ وزیر دادگستری ترکیه می گوید اروپا نمی خواهد ترکیه ثبات داشته باشد روزنامه خبر ترک هم از قول اردوغان خطاب به اروپا نوشت 16 آپریل که تمام شد با هم صحبت می کنیم اما روز گذشته در مورد برگزاری مراسم نوروز در ترکیه به ویژه مناطق کرد نشین گفتیم در دیگر شهرهای ترکیه هم این مراسم برگزار شد از جمله شهر استانبول و با حضور شهردار و استاندار این شهر و این هم توییت آقای اردوغان است به زبان فارسی که نوروز را شاد باش گفته اما حواشی برگزاری مراسم بزرگ نوروز در دیاربکر هم جالب توجه است با توجه به شرایط امنیتی موجود در ترکیه و درگیری میان پیکاکا و دولت ترکیه برگزاری این مراسم هم با محدودیت ها و شرایط امنیتی خاصی همراه بود از جمله بردن پرچم کورت ها به مراسم امسال ممنوع بود اما آنچنان که در ابتدای این ویدیو میبینید به هر ترفندی که بود این پرچم های زرد و قرمز و سبز در هوا بار دیگر چرخانده شد در دیگر شهرهای کردنشین ترکی هم این مراسم برگزار شد و در سوی دیگر جایی که رئیس جمهور با رقص و آواز به دیدار نوروز می رود. در ادامه تصاویری از رقص و شادی امام علی رحمان رئیس جمهور تاجیکستان را خواهیم دید او که همواره دغدغه حفظ میراث و آثار نیاکانی از جمله زبان فارسی را دارد 
و به مردم کشورش توصیه کرده نام فرزندان خود را از میان نام های اصیل فارسی و شاهنامه برگزینند. البته برخی از او در حوزه سیاست انتقاداتی را مطرح می کنند. اما باید گفت او تنها سیاست مدار حال حاضر در قدرت است که در حوزه زبان فارسی دغدغه فرهنگ نیاکانی دارد با این همه گویا نوروز در زادگاه خود ایران غریب تر از هر جایی است و رهبر و مقامات ایران برخلاف امام علی رحمان بیشتر میل دارند با شعارهای تکراری به استقبال نوروز بروند 